Thank you again to our worship team. Thank you for your preparation and time. Thank you for your skill and for practicing so that we can worship the Lord without distraction. We thank you for the the work that you put in and the way you help us with that. So one of the things they tell you you need in seminary when you're preparing for the ministry is humility. It's extra true if you have kids in the ministry. My son very generously, kindly reminded me that there are no 14 chapters in Ephesians. So when I said Ephesians 14, I was wrong. That was Ephesians chapter 4. I hope you found that as we went. Just a reminder that we need to be humble. (laughs) So this morning, we're going to be in James chapter 1. I started a little while back on my occasions that I get to preach and working our way through the book of James. And we will be looking at verses 19 through 27, the end of the first chapter. Now, as you can see from my slide, mirrors are a bit of a theme in my sermon today. They are a part of this passage, so it'll all come back together, even if it doesn't make sense right in the beginning. But we're going to be talking about mirrors a little bit to get us started, just a little bit of a warm-up, so you get used to hearing me talk, I guess. Mirrors have a lot of uses in our culture. For one, something that you might not think about. They're useful in long-range optics. Things like binoculars, telescopes would not work without mirrors. Did you know the largest mirror in the world, what is considered to be a mirror, the largest mirror in the world is actually 20 miles in length. It's a smooth surface in the salt flats in Bolivia, and while it's not always reflective, if you put any thin amount of water on it, it becomes a perfect mirror that you can see from the sky, and it's 20 miles in length. Here's something you may never have thought of without, let's, let's bar reflections from water and natural reflections like that. Without mirrors, you would have no idea what you looked like if it wasn't for cameras. You'd never see your ears. It's just kind of an interesting fact. <laughs> Unless you lose an ear and then you see it, but I hope that doesn't happen to anyone. But mirrors are useful. They're kind of a fascinating thing. I'm not that much of a scientist, but I find science fascinating. Light is something that really interests me. Light and color are really kind of interesting. We think of our eyes kind of like cameras, but in a way they're a lot different. They work more like filters to translate for our brain what light is doing. So in my mind, sometimes I'll think, like, what does something really look like? I know what it looks like to me. I know what it looks like through my eyes. But what does it really look like? It's color bouncing off of surfaces and reflected back into our eye, right? Well, reflections work off that same idea. Light takes the form of waves or rays and bounces off an object and comes back at us. But if the surface is so dense and rough that it's smaller the fiber of the surface is smaller than the waves and rays of light, it actually causes them to bounce back. And that's how we get reflections. We're seeing that off of that surface. That's why if you took a piece of aluminum foil that's not on its own very reflective, if you were to wad it up into a ball and hit it with a hammer a lot, which you can do, and I've seen people do it, it's kind of an interesting experiment, and then you sand it and polish it, The friction of that process makes it so tight-knit that it becomes reflective. It's something that is a metal that's dense, but not naturally very reflective on its own. You can make it. That's why if you take metal and polish it, the friction allows it to bounce back light. So historically, archaeologists have found mirrors that date back 6,000 years, which if you, like us, are young earth creationists, The earth to you is probably somewhere, you would understand it to be somewhere between six and 10,000 years old. So to us, that means mirrors have been around almost as long as we have. Someone very early on invented mirrors. They're usually made by polishing bronze or other reflective metals to a shining surface so that you could see off of them. The best mirrors in ancient times and the times when James is writing were made of a metal called speculum. It's an alloy of copper and tin, which is actually pretty expensive at their time. It wasn't something that you could readily get. So the majority of mirrors in this time were made of copper, or I'm sorry, of bronze. They were made of bronze, and they were polished so that you could see off of them. 
Well, bronze, unlike copper and tin mixed together, is a dark metal. It doesn't give great reflection of color. And when you read passages like 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about seeing is in a mirror darkly. That's because they were looking at mirrors that sometimes, if they were low quality, would reflect back poorly the light that they see. So today, as we look at James, we're going to reflect, and that was a pun, we're going to reflect on the concept that as believers who have the implanted word of truth, as James tells us, the scripture becomes a mirror to us. It reflects back to us our spiritual appearance, showing us our condition and how we need to improve. So we're going to start reading in verse 19. I'll have the um, ESV up on the screen. You can follow along there or in your own Bibles. We'll read between verses 19 and 27. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the, man of, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive, the meekness, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently into the nat to his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, but forgets who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. In James 1, 19 through 27, we see that God wants us to take a look in the mirror of his word and live in light of what we see. So as we look at this passage, we see when looking in the mirror of Scripture, you need to first check your tongue. I'm going to make a, a little bit of a stretch a couple times here, but the truth is in the Scripture. I'm just going to make the wording make sense for a parallel here. Know this, beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James begins this section of the book with a discussion of our reactions, being slow to speak, or I'm sorry, quick to hear and slow to speak. Now I'm looking at that as we're going to focus a lot on our speech, on our tongue and how we use it and how we react because he talks a lot about our reactions and anger in these two verses. This is the idea of being quick to hear, of being reasonable in our reactions. When someone has something to say to us, we should be ready to listen. We should be quick to think about what they say, quick to analyze it, but slow to speak. Often, when we react quickly, our reactions come from the flesh. When we give a quick response, a fast word without really thinking about it, really praying about how we should handle it, especially in a difficult situation, I know we don't always in conversations have time to sit and go, okay, let me pray to the Lord about this, really think about this before I respond. When we're in a difficult situation, it is good to take that time. It's good to say, you know, how about we talk about this later? Give me some time to think about this and respond, especially if someone's being critical of us. It's very easy to hear someone's critique of you or their negative thing of what you have to say and bite back quickly to say something hard and sharp. So James is commanding them to be slow to speak. This isn't an original concept to James. The teaching of Scripture for a long time has talked about us being quick to hear and slow to speak. In the book of Sirach, which is a Jewish writing, is part of the Talmud. It's some of their teaching that they use to uh, apply Scripture to their daily lives. Around the book of 200 BC, he taught something very similar. Now, keep in mind, this isn't scripture. It's not the inspired word of God, but it reflects on Old Testament truth. In the fifth chapter of his book, he says, Be quick to hear, but deliberate in answering. 
If you know what to say, answer your neighbor. But if not, put your hand over your mouth. Honor and dishonor come from speaking, and the tongue of mortals may be their downfall. But in Scripture, we have similar things as well. Proverbs 17, 27 through 28 says, The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint, and whoever has understanding is even-tempered. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent, and discerning if they hold their tongues. We have some colloquialisms that aren't too far from this. One of Mark Twain's famous quotes was, you can either keep your mouth closed and let people think you a fool, or open your mouth and prove it. It's always been one of my favorites. It's a good reminder sometimes. Now, we're not necessarily talking about foolishness here. In this context, James goes quick to talk about, quickly, to talk about our anger, being slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, James, as we've been talking about in this book, is talking about how we need to use the word of God to bring us closer to what he calls perfection, or we would call completion or spiritual wholeness, so that we are more Christ-like, that we become more like Christ in our life. The idea here is that as we grow in knowledge and our wisdom and closeness to God, we should be more like him, reflecting even more of Christ in how we react in our daily life. Now, part of that isn't going to be just doing the right things on the outside. It's not going to be just being polite to people, being kind. It's going to be a requirement of a heart change. We need to be different on the inside so that our outside better reflects Christ. And James is talking not just about how we respond to people, but about the anger in our heart that is often there. We need to be slow to anger. And he points out the fact that our anger, our angry reactions, our bitterness, our sinfulness does not <clears throat> reflect God's righteousness. That idea of wholeness is not shown there, but not only that, it doesn't show the things of God. Now, there can be, as I'm sure we've all discussed plenty of times before, righteous anger, but what James is talking about here is making sure that our speech is even-tempered. Our speech is glorifying to God and how we talk to each other. It can be a hard thing to master, but without that internal change, it's nearly impossible. So there's tons of reminders in Scripture directly about our tongues and a reminder of what our speech does. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. 1 Peter 3:10 says, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceit. Ephesians 4.29 says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the situation, that it may give grace to those who hear. Proverbs 10.19 says, also sum this up, saying, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Now, Ephesians 4 is one of those references we talked about. That's an interesting passage. A lot of people use that passage to say, oh, well, it seems like James really copied a lot from Paul. Well, if you study New Testament history, a lot of people actually believe James was written first. Um, we don't actually think, in light of that, that Paul probably had access to James's text necessarily. Either he might have. But what this teaches us is that the New Testament teaching the teaching that was going around the churches was very similar. And we see really similar thoughts in Ephesians 4. It's talking about the words that are coming out of our mouths. It's talking about putting those away and putting in good things instead. Um, also, we'll see later, he talks about casting off wickedness and putting on Christ's righteousness. He talks about that in James. That's also found in Ephesians 4. So this was the teaching that was going around, but it's a teaching that was important in their time and is important in our time and something that we need to be studying in our church. Now, we talked a lot in preparation for the sermon as we're working through the service about how we as a body are together. Ephesians 4 talked about that too. We are the body of Christ together and when we speak in hurtful ways to those in the body, we harm them. There can be a lot of ways. Like it's mentioned in Proverbs, our words can be like sword thrusts or they can be wise words that bring about healing. Think about times that someone has said something overly critical 
to you and how much it hurt or has said something in a rumor, said something directly just spiteful and mean. Think about the way that that can affect the body of Christ. Or think about times that people have used a good word that brought about healing, that brought about encouragement, that brought about a lifting of your spirit. So James is going to go more in chapter 3 into the discussion of the tongue. So we'll kind of leave it as we wrap up this part of the passage here. But he's going to be talking as we work through this more about how our heart needs to be changed as we become complete Christians. As he says in the end, not only should we be slow to speak, but we should be slow to anger because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We mentioned that a little bit, but it's that idea that when we are quick and we're speaking from our sinful natures, we cannot reflect Christ well in that. Only the bad things of us would come out when we speak from the fleshly side of us. So as we move on to the text, we'll see that James will refer more to the importance of our right response in Christ's work. So the next passage, or the next section of the passage here is going to be the next verse, verse 21, and he's going to tell us to wash your face. So he's using some language here that's a little different. Actually, you could probably even think of it as talking about filthy clothing, removing filthy clothing and putting on good garments. In verse 21, it says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So he's telling us to cast off the filth, the rampant wickedness, the filthiness, and receive with meekness the implanted word. He's going to be talking about that phrase, the implanted word, a couple times, um, and we'll come back to that later. But now we're going to talk a little bit about what this means, of putting off that filthiness, putting off that worldliness. So when we're looking at that in light of a mirror metaphor, uh, you look at the mirror and you see what's wrong, you analyze it, and you fix it, you clean it, you get rid of it. If you worked a hard day out in the yard doing yard work, or say you do construction, you come home and you're just head to toe filthy and dust. There's residue from all the things you've been going through, all the things you've been doing all over you. You look in the mirror and you see that, and then the next thing you do isn't to go, oh, okay, I'm going to go lay on the couch. <laughs> I'm going to go get this all over the couch, make my wife real happy with me. No, you clean it because you're filthy, right? You see that, you cast it off, you get rid of it. So the same idea with clothes. We rid ourselves of the filthy clothes that we have. Now he's talking to young believers reminding them that while we dwell in the world, we get covered in the filthiness, in the uncleanness of the things around us, the rampant wickedness of the world. We are around horrible things, and sometimes when we talk to people, we may participate. If they're gossiping, if they're sharing rumors, we might join in. We might sin in other ways. As we talked about in Ephesians 4, there's a whole list of things that he says to turn away from. Now, there are sins that are going to affect us even as believers. Once we are saved, we are free from the condemnation of sin, but we are not free from our own sin natures. We will still make mistakes. We will still sin. But as we look into the mirror of the word, as we'll get to in the next passage, he describes that more in the next section here anyway. As we look into that mirror and it reflects on us our own sin, we need to cast that sin off to confess it to the Lord, to cleanse ourselves of it, and be made new in his forgiveness, and then go through life. Now, we already have forgiveness of our sins, but when we sin, we still should be confessing it to the Lord and then fixing the problems that we find. As we grow in Christ's likeness, we can no longer be evidencing the works of the world. We're, like we're talking about, we're working toward wholeness in Christ. We're working toward completeness of reflecting his glory better. We should no longer be reflecting the works of the world and how we live. We're to be pure reflections of Christ, no longer demonstrations of wickedness. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Ephesians 4, 22 again says, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former, former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, Colossians 3, 8. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk 
from your mouth. Therefore, Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 1 Peter 2.1 says, So put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander. These texts all support the idea of James 1 here. In living our lives, we accumulate the filth of the world. Despite our newfound place in the family of God, we still have these things that we need to rid ourselves of. Now, if you have not come to Christ for salvation, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus to save you from our sins, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christ came to earth as a man, died on the cross, was rose from the dead, and ascended to heaven so that we could be saved. That if we confess our sins and we put our faith in Jesus for salvation, he will save us from the guilt of our sins. But again, it's a reminder that we still live in the world. We still have a life to live, and we still have a sin nature that we will deal with. We still will have problems. And now we're being reminded to confess those, to cast off that sin, and to live in a godly way. Romans 13 tells us to cast off those old works and put on the armor of light. Now, instead of putting on the armor of light or some of the other teachings we hear of putting on cleanness, James departs a little bit, but he says in a parallel way, he discusses it here. He says, and receive with meekness the implanted word. So the implanted word in some description some translations is the word of truth he also calls it that in verse 18 the word of truth is the scripture it's the whole plan of god it's that's for believers including the gospel it's implanted in our lives at salvation when the holy spirit indwells us there's the conscience the working of the holy spirit that's at work in our lives and an understanding of scripture that a non-believer doesn't have an understanding of God's word that's open to us in a way that non-believers are not able to do. It's not describing the one-time change that happens in the heart of a believer, but it's describing the daily need to put off the sin that weighs us down, the sin that covers us in its filth. And then in its place to apply scripture, to apply the things of the Lord instead. Just as maintaining our appearance doesn't happen just by looking in the mirror, just by seeing that my hair's all messy, it doesn't fix it. Just by seeing that I've come home from work covered in dirt does not fix it. We have to do the work of working toward the right way. We have to cast off that evil. We have to get rid of the works of the flesh, the wickedness of the world. So as we discuss this mirror a little bit in the next passage here, we're going to talk about what we're supposed to do about it. So this next part, when looking in the mirror of Scripture, we need to make a meaningful change. Verse 22, he'll pick up and say, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself saying, Self and goes away at once, forgetting what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now this is obviously where the mirror I've been talking about comes from in the passage. He's making reflection or reference to the mirrors that were used at the time. Actually, can you change to the next slide? Just by fun coincidence, while I've been preparing this during the week, my wife and I went up with some friends to the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and they had a bronze mirror from the second century AD in Rome. It's actually fairly close to where James is writing, about 100 years later. Gives us a little idea. It's a handheld mirror, and you can't see it too well in the picture, also because of the corrosion. <laughs> but there's actually carvings on this side, then on the other side would be the reflective surface. So it was a decorative piece. It was something that they would have around their house. But those hand mirrors were something that they used regularly. This is probably something like the idea 
of what James has in mind as he's talking about a mirror here. Gives us a little bit of an idea. It's not too far different from the hand mirrors that we have today, which we know are glass, but they work in the same way. So he's going to start this passage by telling us first to be doers of the word and not hearers only. This is a theme that comes up way more through the book. We're going to see this a lot as we go through James. In chapter 2, he's going to discuss how we need to have faith and show the validity of our faith by doing the commands of God. In this section, he's going to focus on the idea of that we are followers of Christ. We need to do the things that we're charged to do by Christ. We're supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be living We're supposed to be fixing the things that we find wrong when we look in the mirror of God's word. This may sound similar to you from the parable of the sower. If you want to turn in your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew 13. I don't have this up on the screen. It's a little bit longer passage, so you may want to follow along there. Or you might know it so well that you don't need to. But I'll read in Matthew 13, 3 through 9. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, Some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. Since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on the good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears... Let him hear. Jesus describes the word being shared first with the one who doesn't receive the word on the road. Someone who hears the word and does not make any reception. The seeds are destroyed. They're taken away by, um, by birds. That's different in the analogy. We know the gospel can't be corrupted by not being listened to. But the second ground, the rocky ground, represents someone with no depth in their faith. Someone who does not do the work of following Someone who hears puts in faith, but their life is smothered. Their works for Christ, their reflectiveness for Christ is destroyed by the conditions. They have bad soil. There's too much sun. The things of the world drag them down. Now, there is work that we need to do to progress in life, to grow in Christ-likeness. James then likens believers to a person who looks in a mirror sees their reflection and walks away. That's that idea of, oh man, I'm really messy. Oh, go to bed. It's that idea of walking away, not applying what we learn. Now, the scripture, being a mirror, being our ref- something we look in to see ourselves, being a reflection, what does that require? One, that we have a Bible. Two, that we look in it. In the same way that a mirror doesn't do anything to help me if I don't change what I see there, In the same way that a mirror doesn't help me if I don't look in it, the scripture will not help us in our growth to Christ's likeness if we do not use it. If we don't listen to the preaching of the word, if we do not read our Bible and apply the word. Now, there's plenty of ways we can do this wrong, right? We can look at our Bibles and do nothing with it. We can read a passage of scripture and go, oh, great, now I can go do something else. It's time for a snack or it's time to go get some work done. We can use the Bible in a way that is like this, looking at our reflection in the mirror and walking away, doing nothing about it, right? Or we can meditate on the word to apply it to ourselves. It's that idea, again, of seeing what's wrong in the mirror, of seeing what Scripture teaches, saying, I'm not doing what Scripture tells me I should be doing, and then making the changes accordingly, making the correct changes things that we should be doing, fixing them, going about our lives the right way afterwards. So it's a reminder that we need to be looking at the mirror. We need to be in the scripture. We can't know what the word of God says if we don't know what the word of God says. If our Bible is neglected, if it's left on our shelf to sit in dust, say it sits on our bedside table because we have every intention of reading it when we wake up in the morning or last thing before we go to sleep, but it sits there, it gathers dust, and then once a week we take it out for a nice field trip to church where it sits unopened, unread, unmeditated on, and then goes back, sits in its same nice little square of dust clear on the counter, 
and sits there forever, does it do us any good? Does the Word of God work in our lives if we don't pour over it, if we don't apply it, if we don't meditate on the teachings of the gospel? James tells us that as we look into the law of liberty, which is interchangeably with what in verse 18 he called the Word, we need to change what needs to be changed and remember what we need to learn and be blessed. We can't be the man who looks at Scripture who goes home from church and goes, oh great, the football game's on. Don't have to think about that anymore. Especially if we're feeling conviction. Sometimes it's really tempting to just walk away and be like, oh, whew, that was getting hard. (laughs) I was reading that and I felt convicted. I could just walk away from that and go, what we need to do is apply the things that we learn. Now lastly, we see in this passage, when we look into the mirror of Scripture, we need to make a genuine change. He says in verse 26, If anyone thinks he is religious but does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Visit orphans and widows in their affliction and keep oneself unstained from the world. Religion has become almost a bad word in general Christian society. People will say, I'm not religious, I'm a Christian. Or, I'm not religious, but I do go to church. Or, I hate religion, but I love God. I've heard things like that from people before, and it's it's tempting to try to see what they're saying, to go along with what they're saying. They're talking about a hollow religion. They're talking about rote things, that you're following the things you're supposed to do because some guy in a pulpit told you to. But James is speaking positively of religion here. He's speaking in the inspired word of God about how we should be genuine in our religion. So there must be something good about it. I think part of the issue is that we've associated empty religion with all religion. We've associated legalism and hollow demands of rote following of rules with religion. That's not religion. We don't have a good definition. A good definition of religion is the external, observable qualities of the life of faith in Christ. So saying that means that religion is what we have when we follow Christ. It's what things look like when we're living for Jesus. So Christ tells us, to obey the word of God. He's given specific things to do, and when we do that, we're practicing our faith. The Bible tells us that we should fellowship with other believers. You can't do that if you're not fellowshipping with other believers. That's what the purpose of our fellowship here, the body of Christ. We're supposed to be a part of a local body. We're commanded to do that. So religion is those good things. Now, it can seem to other people to be something else. And James addresses that. He says, if anyone thinks he is religious but does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Now, we can harm others. We can harm the church of Christ. We can harm non-believers by saying we're religious people but being hypocrites. We can bring a bad name to the body of Christ when we don't live in a Christ-like way. Now, he contrasts that idea with what he says true religion is here. And as we get into the next chapter, this is going to be a big thing. He talks a lot about how the church should not favor one person because of their position in society, because of their wealth, because of their importance, that we need to love all people in the church as one. And he's going to focus on how that's reflected or reflective of pure religion in this last verse. He said, religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. In our society, we have some, maybe not enough, provision to help people who are downtrodden. In some cases, maybe that's used the wrong way. Some cases, that's good. We are told as a church, though, that we should be supporting orphans and widows. Now, there's some background truth to that. There's some implications to that, but there's just the surface truth too. We should be caring for those who in 
James was society, widows were people that could not take care of themselves in most cases. They usually wouldn't have jobs. They would be dependent upon their families to care for them. They did not have a husband to provide. They were then dependent on that. Orphans, in the same way, if they didn't have a family to provide, they were helpless. There's literally a need for us to be helping those without. Now, we do that in a lot of ways. We do have, have benevolence that we give as a church. There are ways we as individuals can do that for people outside the church or widows and orphans in our church. There are going to be cases where there's people who just have genuine physical needs, and we can bless them and help them in that. That is something that we as a church strive to do. There's also the background emphasis of this too. If you're con contrasting widows and orphans with the rich and prosperous people in society, when you think about it, if you make friends with a really well-known doctor here in Rochester, there might be some prestige that comes with that. You might get to go to their cabin on the weekends. You might get to spend time with them at fancy places that you normally wouldn't. There might be some seemingly good benefits. And not that those things are bad, not that you can't be friends with people who are prosperous. The idea, though, is that there's no worldly gain, no outward prestigious gain from helping those who are the least fortunate in our societies. By helping those who don't have good things, you don't look better genuinely. Most people try to, in our society nowadays, use things like social media to promote their charity. If you're doing genuine charity, though, it's not for making yourself look good. It's not for prosperity. The idea is to genuinely help those by making your religion, your desire to reflect Christ in the world, your focus, you're then genuinely caring for those people. Now, as we wrap up, we've been looking, as James teaches us here, to focus on the different aspects that we see in reflection upon looking at the Scripture. He might be challenging you to work on your anger. God might be challenging you through this text to make sure that how you respond is glorifying and honoring to him. Knowing that your anger does not produce the righteousness of God, he might be telling you to put aside the things of the world. He might be working in your heart to use the mirror that is your Bible, the, that is the scripture, to work on yourself, to make yourself more Christ-like. It might be a reminder that you need to be a greater help to those around you. Now remember as we study scripture that this is God's word. We are reminded that we are to become more like him by studying it, by reading it, by applying it. Let's look to the Lord in prayer as we contemplate that. And thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for the way that you have blessed us with the opportunity to have it. As we live in a world where we can access the Bible in more ways than anyone before us, that we have it on our phones, most of us probably have a shelf of Bibles at home. We have so many resources but it's so easy to neglect them, to leave them aside. We pray, Lord, that you would help us, though, to use your word of truth that you've implanted in us, that at the time of salvation, you've given us the truth of your scripture. Help us to understand the word of God. Help us to understand what you would have us to do to grow, to continue to be more like you so that we can reflect Christ in how we live. And we pray as we go about our life this week that we wouldn't be those who turn quickly away from the reflection of Scripture and go about our lives forgetting to change the flaws that we see, but that we would apply Scripture, that we would grow and develop to be more Christ-like in how we live. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.